guys, welcome to the Parson series. So we have successfully finished our uh, diseases of the eye chapter uh, 1 that is lens. Today we are going to start with the another chapter and that is glaucoma. I think uh, this will be a fun filled chapter because you know it's always a uh, more dynamic topic in comparison uh, to the cataract and uh, glaucoma you know uh, the mechanism of um, the things which are taking place around this angle of anterior chamber and the pathophysiology of this aqueous drainage always takes a toll. So let's get started uh, with the introduction part. Glaucoma is a chronic progressive optic neuropathy. So uh, I think you must be remembering that we always start with the same definition. It is a multifactorial, it is a uh, optic neuropathy which is characterized by the retinal ganglionic cell death by the apoptosis. So there are so many things which are actually occurring in the glaucoma and one of the most important thing is that this is actually a chronic disease and it is a progressive disease and it's a optic neuropathy which can be occurring by a group of ocular conditions that is why we say that it's a multifactorial condition and it will be leading to the loss of visual function optic neuropathy will be leading to the visual field defects all right now what is the most common risk factor the most common risk factor is a raised intraocular pressure so this is actually the very first thing that comes into our mind when we say that there is glaucoma in all the conditions of the glaucoma we may not have the raised intraocular pressure that is another thing a separate sub branch of the glaucoma but whenever we have glaucoma the first instinct that comes to our mind is actually the raise intraocular pressure all right now this sustained increase in the intraocular pressure may be due to the increased formation of aqueous humor or there can be a difficulty in its exit or there can be a raised pressure in the episcleral veins now you have to understand this that the intraocular pressure is actually associated with the aqueous humor. So more aqueous humor, more intraocular pressure. Now why I can have more aqueous humor? If I have more aqueous humor, either I am having more formation of aqueous humor or I will have lesser drainage. And the third important thing is it can be back pressure changes that can be due to the increased episcleral venous pressure. So whenever you are thinking about the changes or the conditions where you have the raised intraocular pressure, where you have the glaucoma, you have to think about whether there is a more formation here or there is lesser drainage or there is some condition due to which we have got increased episcleral venous pressure. All right. Now of these, the first and the last rarely occurs. Now see, they have made very easy for you. They are already saying that the conditions where you have more secretion of aqueous humor, like one such thing is your hypersecretory glaucoma that occurs in epidemic dropsy. So that is very, very rare. And again, it's not very common to have the raised episcleral venous pressure. So a condition where I have uh, raise intraocular pressure due to the increased formation of aqueous humor or due to the increased episcleral venous pressure are very very limited. So most of the time therefore when I am having the glaucoma I have to think about the decreased drainage. So this is there. Now and they say that it follows that the raised intraocular pressure is essentially due to the increased resistance to its drainage through the angle of anterior chamber or it could be due to the circulation of the aqueous uh, at the pupil. See, uh, we will be learning about the pathophysiology, but uh, what you already know, this is your um, cornea, you have got iris here. Uh, let's take a very basic line diagram. You have got the ciliary body and this is your lens and rest of the eye. Yes, now what you already know is that the ciliary body will be giving you the aqueous humor, yes, the ciliary processes are giving you aqueous humor and what is the normal direction? So the direction is towards the anterior side. 
So, because the ciliary processes are actually directed anteriorly, whatever aqueous humor will come out, it will go through the towards the pupil, then it will come in the anterior chamber, then it will uh, pass on through this angle of the anterior chamber and then it will be flowing through this trabecular meshwork. Now, this is what is normal. You are having something like this, you are having something like this, then you are having this flow, this flow and then it is going through this trabecular meshwork. That means whenever aqueous humor is coming, okay, by blue, you know that um, I always use this aqua blue color <coughs> to represent this aqueous humor. It is always first going into this posterior chamber and then it has to go into this anterior chamber. Alright, is it visible to you? And if you see this area is your pupil. This area is a pupil. So, obviously, if you look at the flow of aqueous humor from the posterior chamber into the anterior chamber, this pupil is going to play a major role. So, if there is any blockade at the level of pupil, I will have a problem in its drainage. Okay, exit will be a problem. Yes, once it has gone into the anterior chamber and uh, then it has to pass through this angle. So, another important, you know, area where I can have a problem in its drainage is the angle and in the angle. Now, what are the structures which are present at the angle? We will be discussing those. So, uh, out of all these structures which are present at the angle, one of the important things which is responsible for uh, its drainage is your trabecular meshwork. That is your trabecular meshwork and uh, you know that um, this trabecular meshwork is a sieve like meshwork which is present here and um, this sieve like meshwork is actually responsible for about 90% of the aqueous drainage. So obviously if I am having some problem, some blockage at the level of trabecular meshwork, more about 90% of the aqueous humor drainage is disturbed and therefore I will be having the glaucoma. So, this is the broad outline, keeping this in mind, we'll go uh, forward. So, there are um, two aqueous outflow, pa outflow pathways, the major one is the trabecular one and the smaller one is your uveoscleral pathway. If the outflow through the trabecular meshwork is blocked, some additional drainage does occur through the uveoscleral, but these alternative channels are not efficient and they are incapable of dealing with the sudden changes of the intraocular pressure. So, thing is very, very clear that if I have a problem with the trabecular meshwork, whole lot of aqueous humor is collected and whole of this uh, burden is not able to tackled by the uveoscleral outflow. So, I will have lot of pressure at the level of uh, this trabecular meshwork because drainage is not taking place and certainly I will have glaucoma. All right. Now, if you look at um, this picture, they are showing you the aqueous pathway and the structures which are present in the angle of anterior chamber. So, the same one that I draw, uh, how will you review this? See, this area is a cornea. So, only the uh, angle which uh, at which they have drawn is little different, otherwise it's same. See this one, okay. And uh, this is uh, your iris, try to comprehend means they have shown you the, only the half of the part. So, if uh, I show you, suppose this is your cornea and um, this is your iris, this is your ciliary body and we have got the lens here. So, what they have done is they have taken only this part because uh, many times, you know, I have seen students uh, struggling with these kind of uh, diagrams and flowcharts. So, it's, uh, uh, it's the same thing, okay. And uh, see, they are showing you this aqueous humor and it is flowing like this. Can you see this uh, one? This is same again, the aqueous humor they have shown you with the help of the blue arrows, okay. And what are these? These are your ciliary zonules, something like these are your ciliary zonules and this is your ciliary body, okay. So, this aqueous humor is traveling here. Now, what is this? This is your trabecular meshwork, then we have got this oval one, this is your Schlem's canal and then it is going into the aqueous veins and then it will be going into the episcleral veins. So, simple one, okay, don't get confused. All these things are same that we show in the line diagram. Now, if you go to the pathogenesis, the pathogenesis is attributed to a combination of the factors which are actually affecting the axonal health and um, all these factors are interrelated. See, whenever we are talking of some chronic disease, um, most of the time the pathophysiology is actually interlinked between so many factors and you cannot just comprehend one single factor on which it is 
dependent all right so if you look at here this is your flow chart now let's try to see how it is actually responsible for the ganglionic cell death because uh, you must have noticed this also that so many times they ask you this question that which cells are actually uh, dying in cases of glaucoma so i have got something uh, uh, which is the most important thing in the glaucoma and that is your raised intraocular pressure so when i have got this raised intraocular pressure it is causing two things one is your mechanical damage it is causing a stretching it is causing and second is your the exoplasmic flow so uh, what is happening it is actually decreasing the amount of perfusion it is decreasing the amount of oxygen going to the optic disc so this is decreasing your optic disc perfusion so i am having the ischemia so if i am having the ischemia there there will be cell death i think this is the very basic pathology yes or no it's nothing new so if i have the ischemia if i have the hypoxia i will have cell death and cell death with cell death will take place so you know that optic nerve if i talk about this optic nerve optic nerve is the continuation of the nerve fiber layer of the retina okay and nerve fiber layer of the retina actually contains the exons of ganglionic exons of the ganglionic cells so that means this nerve fiber layer which is making the optic disc contains the exons of the ganglionic cells or so ganglionic cells are present and therefore these cells are dying because cell death can take place either by the apoptosis or by the necrosis so here it is taking place by the apoptosis so i think this pathophysiology is very very clear right now what are the two main influences as we have discussed just now one is your mechanical changes and another is your decreased perfusion pressure of the optic nerve head so most of the changes that you get in the glaucoma are either due to the mechanical changes or due to the decreased perfusion of the optic nerve head now talking about the mechanical changes let's start the coats of the eye can withstand fairly high intraocular pressure except at the lamina cribrosa uh, see what they are saying is that i have got two kind of changes one is your mechanical changes one is your vascular changes mechanical changes uh, because it's a adult eye so coats of the eye are firm and they are able to withstand the pressure what are the coats of the eye let's revise our anatomy so we have got three coats of the eye uh, if you remember we have got the fibrous coat then i have got uh, what you called as the vascular coat and third is your nervous coat so we have got three coats of the eye so they are able to withstand but there is one area which is actually weak which is that area which is weak so if you remember our eyeball anatomy it was something like this and there was a part of the sclera through which the optic nerve fibers comes out so this part of the sclera through which the optic nerve fibers are coming out that is showing you a cribri form appearance fenestrated appearance so this is actually called as your lamina cribrosa this is called as the lamina cribrosa and uh, these areas are actually not able to withstand this high pressure so what is happening the nerve fibers which are supported by the glial tissue have to bend over the edge of the disc so what is happening whenever you have got the raised intraocular pressure that will uh, be putting the mechanical pressure over this which will alter the capillary blood flow decreasing the exoplasmic flow in the initial stages so because it's a neural tissue uh, what is happening this will uh, cause the uh, stasis in the flow of exoplasma what is exoplasma it is a cytoplasm there so there is a exostasis and due to the exostasis there will be certain changes that you will be noticing later significant backward displacement is there and the compaction of the lamina plates narrows the opening through which they are passing and damaging the nerve fiber bundles so you have got you know direct hampering taking place of this optic nerve actually what happens whole of the eyeball is getting the similar kind of changes see when i talk about the glaucomatous changes it is something like this okay this is your um, iris and the lens now whenever you have got more amount of aqueous humor right what is happening the pressure in the aqueous humor area will be increasing anterior segment will increase and the vitreous cavity pressure is remaining same so obviously there will be the flow of fluid from the high pressure area to the low pressure area so now i am having high pressure 
here and this will be causing the mechanical stretching. Now all the cords are able to withstand but there is an area where what is happening, the optic nerve fibers are coming out. So that area of the sclera is actually very very thin, it is fenestrated, it is cribbed form and therefore this area is not able to withstand the pressure and it is going and uh, it is causing the exoplasmic flow um, stresses in the optic nerve fibers and therefore you will have decreased perfusion you will have hypoxia ischemia in this area and that is the reason why we have the prominent optic neuropathy in cases of glaucoma. But this does not mean that we have only the optic neuropathy because uh, we have got certain other changes also because you know the, that is not going directly to the optic nerve it is going to the other codes also only then it is transmitted to the optic nerve fibers that means it is also affecting what it is also affecting the outer rim of the retina it is also affecting the outer rim of the retina and because it is affecting the outer rim of the retina which contains the rods therefore you will see that there are certain other changes also which are occurring when the person is having uh, this glaucoma we will have um, the night blindness uh, kind of a thing that is your delayed dark adaptation you will have constriction of your visual fields because if you look at the physiology part of the retina where you have got the rods and cones so rods are actually located in the mid periphery cones are located in the core center so therefore what is happening i will be having the constriction because now rods are affected more and more and when once the rods are affected i will have the constriction of the field and that is the reason why we will have finally the tunnel vision in cases of glaucoma now secondly i'll talk about the vascular perfusions what i was talking uh, just now that uh, th their perfusion is also affected because of the lack of uh, auto regulatory mechanism now the moment i have got more pressure and it is affecting the uh, perfusion part of the optic nerve it is getting affected because it does not have any auto regulatory mechanism if there is a sustained increase in the intraocular pressure that can also decrease the capillary blood flow due to the mechanical compression of the vessels at the lamina crebrosa. So now what is happening at the lamina crebrosa, lamina crebrosa as I told you is that part of the sclera through which the optic nerve fibers are coming out. So this is a you know a delicate part uh, which is actually having so many fenestrations there. So it is causing compression there. So there will be mechanical compression of the vessels because you know that we have got great vessels coming in the center. That is your central retinal artery and central retinal vein. So if I have got something like this, if you look here, if I have got something like this and this is your optic nerve and I have got increased pressure. So obviously this will cause the compression of the vessels and this compression of the vessels is causing a lot of damage because we do not have any autoregulatory mechanism. Alright. Then uh, we also have um, fall in the perfusion pressure. We also have a fall in the perfusion pressure at the optic disc and uh, this can be precipitated by the additional factors. It could be hypotension, it could be vasospasm as well as the acute blood loss. Alright, now we will talk about the other factors. What could be the other factors that <coughs> could be responsible for the pathophysiology of the glaucoma? Uh, it is believed that the patients who are having the primary open angle glaucoma have a susceptibility to damage because they have got larger openings in the lamina cribrosa that allows for the greater mechanical displacement of the nerve fibers uh, which are coursing through. Now because you know primary open angle glaucoma is the most common type of glaucoma that you see clinically in the patients, uh, we are first talking about that and they are saying that they have got larger openings in the lamina cribrosa. Now larger the openings obviously there will be more susceptibility to the damage and uh, Therefore, the compression that we are getting at the level of lamina cribrosa of the fibers will obviously be more. Now, dysfunctional exoplasmic transport due to these mechanical or vascular changes will lead to the fewer trophic factors which are reaching the ganglionic cells and ultimately um, the raised intraocular pressure by the way of mechanical uh, factors, by the way of vascular factors is reaching to your ganglionic cells and ganglionic cell death is going to take place which will be triggering the apoptosis of the adjacent cells. So the, in this way actually it is ultimately leading to the cell death or the apoptosis of the ganglionic cells. As the loss of the nerve fibers extends beyond the normal uh, physiological overlap, visual field defects and uh, uh, time and again you know 
we know that uh, optic nerve fibers are responsible for your visual field. So, if I am having more and more optic neuropathy due to the death of the ganglionic cells, I am going to have the visual field defects also. So, this loss of nerve fibers is uh, seen to occur initially and this is especially at the superior and inferior poles. Now, this is the same thing that um, we discuss in classes that if this is your optic disc and um, the cup. So, you have got a cup also and what was the normal CD ratio 0 0.3 to 0 0.4. So, first we have got the selective loss at the superior as well as the inferior poles. Because of the selective loss of superior inferior poles, the cup will become vertically oval and this is called as vertically oval cupping. So, what is the basis of getting this vertically oval cup in cases of glaucoma is the selective loss at the superior and inferior poles. The normal distribution of the nerve fibers in the retina is such that the polar uh, loss of the nerve fibers translates into a loss of function in an arch above and below ending in a horizontal line nasally with neither crossing it and um, that is why what is happening because we have got the selective loss of the superior inferior fields therefore the um, visual field that is actually presentable in the patients of glaucoma is more of horizontal and that is why it is actually represented by a horizontal line. So, this is very very clear I think all right can you see the same thing they have shown you here um, in the image as well as in the diagram right. Now, coming to the diagnosis part. So, we all know that in glaucoma, in order to make a diagnosis, we require a triad. And what is that triad? The triad is having the raised intraocular pressure. We have got raised intraocular pressure. Then we have got the optic disc changes and then we have got the visual field defects. So, if I have got these three things, then we surely say that it is glaucoma, but at least you require two criteria. So, if I have one, two and this is three. So, at least I require two criteria out of these in order to say that it is glaucoma. It, it can be two or more than two that is three. So, what they are saying that there should be certain combination of the clinical changes that, that I do require in order to make a diagnosis of glaucoma and these are your changes in the optic nerve head. We have got abnormalities in the visual field and the rise in intraocular pressure. So, this is your simple triad that we read. The type of glaucoma is determined by the clinical features and the status of the anterior chamber that is by gonioscopy. Now, once you have seen that it is a glaucoma, you have got raised intraocular pressure, you have got optic disc changes and the visual field effects, you are clear that it is glaucoma. Now, what is the type of glaucoma? Whether it is open angle glaucoma, whether it is angle closure glaucoma, that you can be telling by the gonioscopy. What is gonioscopy? Gonio plus scopy. Gonio means the angle and scopy means the visualization. So, when you are visualizing the angle of anterior chamber and you are able to see all the five structures, how many structures do we have in angle? It is the five structures. So, if I am able to see all the five structures, it is an open angle, but I am having a glaucoma. So, it is an open angle glaucoma, right? And what are the types? of clinical features I have I am having that that uh, will help me to say that what kind of glaucoma it is like it could be um, a congestive glaucoma or it can be a pigmentary glaucoma or it can be a exfoliative glaucoma any kind of glaucoma inflammatory glaucoma if it, the clinical features are like this so I will have to see the angle I will have to see the clinical features I will have to look at the triad also a diagnosis of open angle glaucoma can be made with at least with at least two of these three abnormalities. So, uh, that is what uh, we have already discussed that if two out of these three things or these three criteria are present, then we can say that it is actually a glaucoma in acute and the chronic uh, angle closure glaucoma as well as secondary glaucomas. See a very important thing in cases of the angle closure glaucoma right? The uh, raised intraocular pressure is enough to make a diagnosis of glaucoma. That means in cases of secondary glaucomas as well as in cases of the angle closure glaucoma, whether it is primary or secondary, they are so sudden, they are so acute that you do not have the time for the optic disc changes as well as visual field defects. There uh, you will have only most of the times a raised intraocular pressure and that should be sufficient and that is sufficient to make a diagnosis. So, obviously, 
raise intraocular pressure is I think the most important factor that could be associated with the glaucoma. But certainly when it comes to open angle glaucoma, it's uh, best if you have a triad or at least two things should be there. So, very, very important thing, all right. Now, first we start with the optic nerve head changes. Uh, these are actually seen prior to the development. They are seen prior to the development of the visual field loss. And uh, what is the normal CD ratio? Normal CD ratio is actually 0 0.3 is to 1. Now, what is actually CD ratio? C to D. So, CD ratio means we have got the diameter of the cup upon the diameter of the disc. We have got diameter of the cup upon the diameter of the disc. Diameter of the cup. Cup is a hollow in the center and the disc is whole one. See, if I talk about the optic disc, what is actually optic disc? Let me uh, show you and demonstrate you, you will able to understand. I have got this thick rim here. This is actually the nerve fiber layer. This is the nerve fiber layer of the retina and we have got 10 layers in the retina, we all know. Now, out of 10 layers, only one layer, this thick layer is going to extend in the form of the optic disc and the optic nerve. So, what is happening if I look it from the inner areas, okay, suppose this is your inner fundus. So, what you are going to see, you are going to see this whole of the peripheral disc, this is disc and then you are also able to see this hollow area where you do not have any fibers. So, this hollow area where I do not have any fibers is actually the cup while this one, the outer periphery is a disc and whatever be the thickness of this nerve fiber layer, that will be your neuroretinal rim. You have to understand this only then you will get to know the beauty of uh, the optic disc changes. So, what I am uh, trying to say here, suppose this is your optic disc and uh, you have got a small cup area here. So, whatever is this thickness, this is actually called as the neuroretinal rim. This is called as the neuroretinal rim. This area is called as a cup and um, this area is called as a disc, right. So, central hollow area is the area where I do not have any optic nerve fibers. Now, when I am getting the atrophy of the ganglionic cells, I am getting atrophy of the optic nerve fibers, obviously, this cup is going to extend because it is a hollow area. So, we are slowly and gradually increasing this area. So, if I take this uh, ratio in the normal person, when we have got the healthy optic disc, so the diameter of the cup upon the diameter of the disc is something like 3 by 2. 10 or it could be even 4 by 10. So, the amount of the area, suppose I divide the whole of the disc into 10 parts, into 10 parts. So, how much area this cup is taking? So, if I divide this whole of the disc into 10 areas, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 and 10. So, this cup is actually taking only 3 parts or 4 parts. Therefore, the ratio will be either 3 by 10 or it will be 4 by 10 and this comes to be about 0 0.3 or 0 0.4. Now, when I have got the optic nerve fiber atrophy, this hollow is increasing. Now, it can occupy 5 parts, 6 parts, 7 parts. So, now my CD ratio will be 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9. So, 0 0.9, this is actually 9 by 10. So, this is your near total optic atrophy because it is very little which is left now. And when whole of the optic nerve atrophy has taken place, then that is called as 10 by 10 total optic atrophy. So, this is actually, you know, journey from a car tire to a cycle tire. I always explain uh, like this in the classes. It is a journey from a car tire, a thicker one with a healthy disc with a very small hole in the center towards the cycle tire. Cycle tire with a very thin rim and a large hole. This is your cycle tire. So, it is an easy way of understanding the optic disc changes, okay. So, what are the changes that are going to take place? See, though uh, glaucoma is a bilateral disease, but it is not symmetrical. I will not get exactly similar changes in the optic disc on both sides. So, there is asymmetry. So, there will be asymmetry and uh, 
asymmetry is significant when I uh, I am having the CD ratio difference of at least 0 0.2. Suppose I am having 0 0.7 here and 0 0.8 here, then that is not considered to be asymmetrical. Asymmetrical means at least there should be a difference of 0 0.2 between the two. Then you will have the thinning of the neuroretinal rim. Now that is but obvious. If I have increased size of the cup, I will have the thinning of the neuroretinal rim. And what they are saying that if the CD ratio is more than 0 0.5, especially if in the vertical axis, then that is very, very significant. This is called as a vertically oval optic disc cupping. I told you due to the selective loss of superior uh, fibers and the inferior fibers, I will have vertically oval cup. So, this vertically oval cup, if it is more than 0 0.5, then again very, very significant uh, in cases of open angle glaucoma. I will have pallor of the uh, neuroretinal rim. I will have thinning. Then hemorrhages. Uh, these are called as splinter hemorrhages. See, whenever the intraocular pressure is very high, there is always is a risk that we can have even the hemorrhages over the um, surface of the optic disc. These are called as the splinter hemorrhages. And what else? Then you can have vascular signs. Vascular signs are suggestive of acquired cupping such as the bearing of the curvilinear vessels and overpass of central vessels. We can also have the parapapillary atrophy. Now para means around, papillary means the optic disc. Para means the periphery, right? And um, papillary means optic disc. So, you have got atrophy all around the optic disc and you have got the bearing of the vessels. Now, what is this bearing of the vessels? Bearing of vessels means normally uh, when I talk about the optic disc, suppose this is your optic disc and you have got vertically oval cupping something like this. Now, what is happening? You have got vessels, central retinal artery coming in the center and this is giving you four end arteries, okay? That is why it is called as an end artery because it does not show any collaterals, no anastomosis, nothing. And uh, these will be your supronasal, you have infronasal, you have suprotemporal and you have got infrotemporal. Now, what is happening? Uh, slight tilting of the optic disc is also there. And due to this enlargement of the CD ratio and all, what is happening now, the, there is a turn and these vessels are taking a twist from the temporal side towards the nasal side. They are taking a turn. So, when these vessels are bending towards the nasal side, they, they take a first bend, okay, and they move towards the nasal side. Then they are traversing posterior to the optic disc, behind the surface of the optic disc. So, suppose they are going behind like this, 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 that is I am showing with the dotted one, this is also going behind, behind, behind and when it comes out, okay, again it is tilting, one more time bending is there. So, somehow with two bending, see one bending took place when they were going behind and then they were traversing behind the optic disc and then they again come out and bend. So, this is double bending. So, bearing of the vessels, there is a double bending and when you are seeing it from front, you are seeing the vessels at the first bending, then this is your behind the optic disc, this area you are not seeing and then again when it is coming out. So, it gives you a appearance as if the vessels are broken off at the margins. So, this appearance of um, uh, the breaking off of the vessels at the margins or the double bending, this is also called as the Z bending. So, it is something like this. This is something uh, in the superior one and this is your inferior one. These are called as the bionating sign, nasalization, nasal shifting of the vessels or the bearing of blood vessels. All right. Now, the visual field abnormalities. If I talk about the visual field abnormalities in the glaucoma, uh, you should always remember that they are uh, firstly found in the germs area. Now, what is this germs area? See, when you talk about the visual field defects, you should be first thorough with the retinal fibers, how these retinal fibers are taking place. Suppose this is your field and this is your horizontal raphe and um, you have uh, you have got the central 30 degree, okay. Now, if you uh, concentrate on this, see this is your third. 0 degree, okay. Then you have got 10 degree, 20 degree and this is your 30 degree, okay. So, what is happening? You have got a blind spot also. How the um, 
retinal fibers are actually located. So, for this you have to first consider the optic disc. Suppose this is your what you call as optic disc. Okay. Now, optic disc say how the fibers are actually located. Optic disc is always on the nasal side. So, this will become my nasal side. So, on this area I will have nasal fibers. How nasal fibers are located? These are actually the radial fibers. So, it is something like this. So, these are called as the superior and inferior radiating fibers. You have to be very clear with this concept. These are called as the superior inferior radiating fibers and these are located on the nasal side while other side will become your temporal. So, this side will become my temporal side now. So, on the temporal side what kind of fibers I have? I have got the arc like fibers something like this I have got arc like fibers. So, because uh, you know we have got arc like fibers here therefore what these are called as therefore these are called as the arc weight fibers. Therefore, these are called as the arc weight fibers. So, on the nasal side, I have got radiating fibers, superior radiating, inferior radiating. On the temporal side, I have got arc weight fibers, superior arc weight, inferior arc weight. Now, if you see the fields. So, the fields are always diagonally opposite. If I show you one more um, diagram, this is your eyeball, something like this. And on the nasal side, I have got the optic disc and the optic nerve like this. Okay. Now, this is your eyeball. So, this area will become your nasal retina and this area will become your temporal retina. This will become temporal retina. Now, nasal retina always contains the optic disc and the optic nerve. Now, what about the fields? Fields are always diagonally opposite. So, this nasal retina will correspond to a visual field which is actually temporal visual field while this temporal retina will always correspond to a field which is your nasal visual field. This is your nasal visual field. So, I have got that means this area which is my optic nerve and the anterior most area this is your optic disc okay this will correspond to which field this will be corresponding to the temporal visual field now this means that the blind spot that i have you know this area is a vacuum area this area is a vacuum and I will not have any image formation here. So, in the temporal visual field, this will correspond to a scotoma which is actually called as a blind spot. So, this area is called as a blind spot. So, when I draw the visual field, okay, what will be happening? This optic disc area will be corresponding to my blind spot in my temporal visual field. So, you have to be very clear that the retinal fibers and the visual field that will be affected will be diagonally opposite. So, what they are saying that it is these arcuate fibers which are in the temporal retina, these are in the temporal retina, these are most sensitive to the glaucoma. So, whenever glaucoma starts, the first fibers which are getting affected is these arcuate fibers in the temporal retina. So, which field will be affected? Therefore, first uh, affected will be your nasal visual field. Therefore, the first to get affected will be the nasal visual field and that is why it is a temporal field which is last to be affected in the patients of the glaucoma. Now, uh, they are using a word called as germs area. What is this germs area? Germs area is actually your arcuate area. So, these arcuate fibers, okay, the arcuate fibers in the temporal retina, which is from 10 to 25 degree from fixation, they are correlating with the abnormalities. This is actually the area which is most sensitive to the glaucomatous damage. This area is most sensitive to the glaucomatous damage and therefore it is actually the nasal visual field that is first affected and also this uh, scotoma which is actually corresponding to the germs area in the glaucoma, this scotoma will be called as the germs scotoma. So, why it is called as germs scotoma? What is actually germs area? 
what is the distribution of the fibers and why it is the nasal um, field which is first affected. There are so many concepts which are actually important in this part. So, I think uh, we have done with the very basic uh, pathophysiology of glaucoma and you have got the idea of uh, the aqueous drainage, the type of glaucoma, what is the most common type of glaucoma, what are the basic things that we need to have to call it as glaucoma, why do we have the changes due to the increased intraocular pressure, why it is maximum in the optic nerve, what is lamina fibrosa and how it is going to affect the visual field. So, uh, this was all for today. Next time we will be doing the uh, visual field effects in gross, okay. Uh, till then, there are some something that I wanted to talk to you. Yeah, you know, see this is a time taking procedure and it is a small initiative from our side to help you in reading the textbook. Uh, from the time uh, uh, immemorial, you know, we say that reading of textbook is very, very important and Parson being a pearl of ophthalmology is very important. But uh, I used to get so many messages that there is obviously some difficulty um, in reading the Parsons. It is not an easy task. And uh, you know, every line in, if you have seen also the number of lines that I have taught to you, okay, in this one hour is not so many because each line of Parsons has to say much more than you are understanding. You have to read between the lines and it is a basic book for the residency in the ophthalmology also. So, obviously, uh, you have to give an effort in reading it. So, it is highly, highly appreciable that if you read the Parsons along with me and any of the questions, any of the doubts are always welcome. Uh, we are there on all the social media platforms. You, you can always, you know, ask your questions. You can ask your uh, questions in the comment section below and uh, feel free to post your doubts and your feedback, how you are feeling and what are the other things that you want me to make the videos. I always um, want to help those who want to help themselves. So, I, uh, I think uh, this is all for today. See you in the next session of the Parson series. Thank you and happy ophthalmology.